Lesson 3 God's Call to Mission Sabbath Afternoon October 14 The Angel of the Covenant is empowering his servants to carry the truth to all parts of the world. He has sent forth his angels with the message of mercy, but as if they did not speed on their way fast enough to satisfy his heart of yearning love, he lays on every member of his church the responsibility of proclaiming this message. Let him that heareth say, Come. Every member of the church is to show his loyalty by inviting the thirsty to drink of the water of life. A chain of living witnesses is to carry the invitation to the world. Will you act your part in this great work? Jesus is calling for many missionaries, for men and women who will consecrate themselves to God, willing to spend and be spent in his service. Oh, can we not remember that here is a world to labor for? Shall we not move forward step by step, letting God use us as his helping hand? Shall we not place ourselves on the altar of service? Then the love of Christ will touch and transform us, make us willing for his sake to do and dare. Cole Porter Ministry, page 18. God has given us the gift of speech that we may recite to others his dealing with us, that his love and compassion may touch other hearts, and that praise may arise from other souls also to him who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Lord has said, Ye are my witnesses, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. But all who are called to be witnesses for Christ must learn of him, that they may be efficient witnesses. As children of the heavenly King, they should educate themselves to bear testimony in a clear, distinct voice and in such a manner that no one may receive the impression that they are reluctant to tell of the mercies of the Lord. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 243. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given us to proclaim to the world. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. The world is to be warned, and God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. It is not a small matter that the counsels and plans of God have been so clearly opened to us. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. This places on us a heavy responsibility. God expects us to impart to others the knowledge that he has given us. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 19. Sunday, October 15. Moving Beyond Our Comfort Zone. The dwellers on the plain of Shinar established their kingdom for self-exaltation, not for the glory of God. Had they succeeded, a mighty power would have borne sway, banishing righteousness and inaugurating a new religion. The world would have been demoralized, but God never leaves the world without witnesses for him. At this time, there were men who humbled themselves before God and cried unto him. O oh God, they pleaded, interpose between thy cause and the plans and methods of men. Suddenly the work that had been advancing so prosperously was checked. Angels were sent to bring to naught the purpose of the builders. Confusion and dismay followed. All work came to a standstill. The Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. This dispersion was the means of peopling the earth, and thus the Lord's purpose was accomplished through the very means that men had employed to prevent its fulfillment. In our day, the Lord desires that His people shall be dispersed throughout the earth. They are not to colonize. Jesus said, 
Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 16 verse 15. Conflict and Courage, page 43. The fallen world is the battlefield for the greatest conflict the heavenly universe and earthly powers have ever witnessed. It was appointed as the theater on which would be fought out the grand struggle between good and evil, between heaven and hell. Every human being acts a part in this conflict. No one can stand on neutral ground. Men must either accept or reject the world's Redeemer. All are witnesses either for or against Christ. Christ calls upon those who stand under his banner to engage in the conflict with him as faithful soldiers that they may inherit the crown of life. They have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Christ has left them his assured promise that great will be the reward in the kingdom of heaven of those who partake of his humiliation and suffering for the truth's sake. Sons and Daughters of God, page 242. The faithful ambassador of Christ is not ashamed of the banner of truth. He does not cease from proclaiming the truth, however unpopular it may be. In all places, in season, out of season, he heralds the glad tidings of salvation. Missionaries for God are called to face dangers, endure privations, and suffer reproach for the truth's sake, yet amid dangers, hardships, and reproach, they are still to hold the banner aloft. These last-day witnesses are bold soldiers of Jesus Christ. They have tasted of the powers of the world to come. Their feet are not on sliding sand, but on solid rock. They are not easily moved away from the faith once delivered to the saints. These will be strengthened by their leader to cope with difficulties. They are messengers of righteousness, representatives of Christ, revealing the triumphs of grace. Reflecting Christ, page 347. Monday, October 16. Becoming a Blessing to the Whole World The sentence pronounced on Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, was to our first parents a promise of the redemption to be wrought out through Christ. The Messiah was to be of the royal line, for in the prophecy uttered by Jacob the Lord said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Genesis chapter 49 Verse 10. Isaiah prophesied, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 4 to 5. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 222 and 223. Christ left his home of security and peace, left the glory that he had with the Father before the world was, left his position upon the throne of the universe. He went forth a suffering, tempted man, went forth in solitude to sow in tears, to water with his blood the seed of life for a world lost. His servants in like manner must go forth to sow. When called to become a sower of the seed of truth, Abraham was bidden, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8. So those who are called to unite with Christ must leave all in order to follow him. Old associations must be broken up, plans of life relinquished, earthly hopes surrendered. In toil and tears, in solitude and through sacrifice, must the seed be sown. Christ's Object Lessons, page 36.
There are those who may be in favorable positions in all the things of this life, but God may have a work for them to do elsewhere, a work that they could not do among their relatives and friends. The very position of ease and the relatives who surround them may prevent them from developing the very traits of character which God would have them develop. But God sees that to change their position and to send them where their surroundings will be entirely different will be the very best place for them to develop a character which will glorify Him. When we set ourselves where all is convenience and ease, we do not feel so much the necessity of depending moment by moment upon God. God in His providence brings us into positions where we shall feel our necessity of His help and strength. In Heavenly Places, page 112. Tuesday, October 17. Abraham's Call What is temptation? It is the means by which those who claim to be the children of God are tested and tried. We read that God tempted Abraham that he tempted the children of Israel. This means that he permitted circumstances to occur to test their faith and lead them to look to him for help. God permits temptation to come to his people today that they may realize that he is their helper. If they draw nigh to him when they are tempted, he strengthens them to meet the temptation. But if they yield to the enemy, neglecting to place themselves close to their almighty helper, they are overcome. They separate themselves from God. They do not give evidence that they walk in God's way. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1094. Abraham continued to journey southward, and again his faith was tested. The heavens withheld their rain, the brooks ceased to flow in the valleys, and the grass withered on the plains. The flocks and herds found no pasture, and starvation threatened the whole encampment. Did not the patriarch now question the leadings of providence? Did he not look back with longing to the plenty of the Chaldean plains? All were eagerly watching to see what Abraham would do as trouble after trouble came upon him. So long as his confidence appeared unshaken, they felt that there was hope. They were assured that God was his friend and that he was still guiding him. Abraham could not explain the leadings of providence. He had not realized his expectations, but he held fast the promise I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. With earnest prayer he considered how to preserve the life of his people and his flocks, but he would not allow circumstances to shake his faith in God's word. To escape the famine he went down into Egypt. He did not forsake Canaan, or in his extremity turn back to the Chaldean land from which he came, where there was no scarcity of bread but he sought a temporary refuge as near as possible to the land of promise, intending shortly to return where God had placed him. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 128 and 129. The faith of Abraham should be our example, yet how few will patiently endure a simple test of reproof for the sins which imperil their eternal welfare. How few receive reproof with humility and profit by it. God's claim upon our faith, our services, our affections should meet with a cheerful response. We are infinite debtors to the Lord and should unhesitatingly comply with the least of his requirements. In order to be a commandment breaker, it is not necessary that we should trample upon the whole moral code. If one precept is disregarded, we are transgressors of the sacred law. But if we would be true commandment keepers, we should strictly observe every requirement that God has enjoined upon us. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 253. Wednesday, October 18. 
The Early Church and Comfort Zones After the disciples had been driven from Jerusalem by persecution, the gospel message spread rapidly through the regions lying beyond the limits of Palestine, and many small companies of believers were formed in important centers. Some of the disciples traveled as far as Phenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word. Their labors were usually confined to the Hebrew and Greek Jews, large colonies of whom were at this time to be found in nearly all the cities of the world. It was God who gave to the early believers the name of Christian. This is a royal name given to all who join themselves to Christ. It was of this name that James wrote later, Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? James chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And Peter declared, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 16 and 14. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 155 and 157. Peter overcame his natural prejudice as to sit at table with the Gentile converts. But when certain Jews who were zealous for the ceremonial law came from Jerusalem, Peter injudiciously changed his deportment toward the converts from paganism. This revelation of weakness on the part of those who had been respected and loved as leaders left a most painful impression on the minds of the Gentile believers. The church was threatened with division, but Paul, who saw the subverting influence of the wrong done to the church through the double part acted by Peter, openly rebuked him for thus disguising his true sentiments. Peter saw the error into which he had fallen and immediately set about repairing the evil that had been wrought so far as was in his power. God, who knows the end from the beginning, permitted Peter to reveal this weakness of character in order that the tried apostle might see that there was nothing in himself whereof he might boast. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 197 and 198. Christ sought to teach the disciples the truth that in God's kingdom there are no territorial lines, no caste, no aristocracy, that they must go to all nations bearing to them the message of a Savior's love. But not until later did they realize in all its fullness that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Thursday, October 19 Starting from where you are Christ commissioned his disciples to do the work he had left in their hands, beginning at Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been the scene of his amazing condescension for the human race. There he had suffered, been rejected, and condemned. The land of Judea was his birthplace. There, clad in the garb of humanity, he had walked with men, and few had discerned how near heaven came to the earth when Jesus was among them. At Jerusalem, the work of the disciples must begin. In view of all that Christ had suffered there and the unappreciated labor he had put forth, the disciples might have pleaded for a more promising field, but they made no such plea. The very ground where he had scattered the seed of truth was to be cultivated by the disciples, and the seed would spring up and yield an abundant harvest. In their work, the disciples would have to meet persecution through the jealousy and hatred of the Jews, but this had been endured by their master, and they were not to flee from it. The first offers of mercy must be made to the murderers of the Savior. The Desire of Ages, page 820. We are nearing the close of this earth's history. 
Soon we shall stand before the great white throne. Your opportunities for work will soon be past. Therefore work while it is called today. With the help of God, every true believer can see where there is work to be done. When the human will cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent, and the worker can make opportunities. Watch for the souls with whom you come in contact. Watch for opportunities to speak a word in season to them. Do not wait for an introduction or until you become acquainted with them before you seek to save the perishing souls around you. If you will go to work in earnest, ways will open before you for the accomplishment of this work. Lean upon the divine arm for wisdom, strength, and skill for the work that God has given you to do. Our High Calling, page 298. Will our churches now arise and awake to the situation? The representatives of Christ are to carry a burden for souls. Every nation and kindred and tongue and people is to hear the last message of mercy to the world. When our church members have a better understanding of Bible truth, they will arouse from their drowsy slumber and will be ready to devote their money to the cause of God and to give themselves in earnest labor under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God's people are His agents, appointed to proclaim the truth in all parts of the world. Every church member is to engage in active service for the Master. Why stand ye here all the day idle? He asks. Go today in my vineyard, work while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. Reflecting Christ, page 204. For further reading, This Day with God, Let Your Light Shine, page 211, and Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, Bring Us Not into Temptation, pages 117 to 120.